Luke 19, 28 through 44. On December 4th, 1977, in Bangui, which is the capital of Central African Empire, uh, no longer exists, uh, there in Bangui on that day, the world press witnessed the coronation of His Imperial Majesty Bokasa I. And the price tag for, for that single event designed and choreographed by a famous French designer was $25 million. At 10.10 10 a.m. Uh, that morning, the blare of trumpets and the, the roll of drums announced the approach of His Majesty and the procession began with eight of Bokasa's 29 official children parading down the royal carpet to their seats. They were followed by Jean Bedel Bokasa II, heir to the throne, dressed in a white admiral's uniform with gold braid. Uh, he was seated on a red pillow uh, to the left of the throne. And then Catherine followed the favorite of Bokasa's nine wives. Uh, she was wearing a $73,000 gown made by uh, Lonvan. Lonva, I think that's it, right? Lonva of Paris, strewn with pearls that she had picked out herself. Uh, the emperor arrived then in his imperial coach, bedecked with gold, ink, not golden eagles, but with gold, solid gold eagles, drawn by six matched Anglo-Norman horses. And then when the marine band blared the sacred march of his majesty, Emperor Bokasa I, his highness then strode forth, cloaked in a 32-pound robe decorated with 785,000 strewn pearls and gold embroidery. Uh, white gloves adorned his hands, pearl slippers on his feet. Uh, on his brow, he wore a gold crown of laurel wreaths like those worn by uh, the Roman consuls of old, a symbol of the favor of the gods. Uh, as the sacred march finally came to a conclusion. Bokasa seated himself on his two and a half million dollar eagle throne. He took his uh, gold laurel wreath off. And as Napoleon, 173 years before had done, he took his own two and a half million dollar crown, which was topped with an 80 carat diamond and placed it upon his head. And December 4th, 1977, we saw the, the, uh, the ordination or the coronation that is of a new emperor. Now, sadly for Bokasa, but fortunately for everybody else, uh, his reign was not as imposing as his coronation. But just two years later, while Bokasa was out of the country, the French engineered a coup. And uh, so no more uh, King Bokasa. It came too late for a lot of his subjects, you know, among them 200 children who were uh, had been executed because they complained about the expense of their school uniforms. Um, but he was out. Bokasa did his best to establish a glorious and enduring kingdom, but rather notoriously, it failed. And that's the way it is with the kings and the rulers of the earth. Try as they will, even though they cling so tightly, uh, when death comes, they always lose their kingdom or their Reich or their empire. They leave it all behind. But every Palm Sunday, every Palm Sunday and often at other times, we who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we rejoice because it was not so with the King of Kings. Uh, he was a new kind of king. Uh, he was and is a king who operates from an entirely different kind of principle. Uh, Luke's account of what's called the triumphal entry of Christ, uh, I've called a humble coronation. Uh, this account gives us an insight into true and majestic royalty, totally unlike that of, nor of mortal man. As we take up Dr. Luke's narrative today, Jesus has spent about the last nine months, I would say. We might have spent the last nine months. Uh, but the Lord has spent the last nine months or so going back and forth across Galilee and then Samaria and uh, Perea and Judea, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And, and he's, he's told people about the nature of the kingdom. He's told them how to enter it. And he's told them how to live as kingdom citizens. 
And one source points out that uh, Jesus had ministered in probably 35 different locations, like just general locations, and, and yet he had worked out everything with all of that nine months and all these different locations. He worked out everything so that he would be approaching Jerusalem at precisely this time. He always kept to his father's timetable, um, and that ensured that he would be in Jerusalem just in time for Passover. And in fact, he would be there just in time for just exactly the right Passover. As we talked about last week, messianic expectations were, were really running high among the Jews at this time. And in fact, by the time uh, uh, that this happened, the atmosphere was absolutely electric. Jesus had, had just told the multitude traveling with him once again that he was not going to establish the kingdom at this time. We talked about it last week. But most people were sure nonetheless that that's exactly what was going to happen. Uh, masses of people were following Jesus on the road and many others were coming out uh, from the city of Jerusalem to meet him. And, and all the while, uh, the religious leaders were plotting his elimination. And then his staged entrance, if I can call it that, his, his staged entrance into the city, it's going to fuel the people's expectations even more and further challenge the religious leadership. As today's text begins, Jesus is on his final approach to Jerusalem. So let's read the, the first eight verses of today's text, Luke 9, 10, verses 28 through 35. And we read, when he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. That's referring to the, the parable of the of the minas. When he had said this, he went ahead, on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he came near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, what are, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. After his ministry to Zacchaeus and his teaching uh, that I've just mentioned about the parable of the, the ten minas, um, around all of that around Jericho. After that, Jesus continued his journey toward Jerusalem. It was about 17 miles with a, with a vertical ascent of about 3,000 feet, which it impressed, it seemed like every commentary I've read mentions is this for some reason, and maybe it's a big deal, uh, you know, but it would be, you know, from Jericho it's a, to Jerusalem, it's about 17 miles, and then there's this vertical ascent of about 3,000 feet uh, crossing the Mount of Olives. Uh, if you've ever hiked around Boulder, the, uh, the change of elevation is about the same there if you go from the city itself up uh, between uh, Green Mountain and Bear Peak. You know, uh, Boulder's uh, 5,328 feet and Bear's 8,459. So, you know, it'd be a similar thing, but over a longer distance. And we learn from John's gospel that Jesus, uh, probably with his disciples, broke that up somewhat. He spent the night before he arrived in Jerusalem at the home of his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus there in Bethany on the eastern slope of the mountain, about two miles from Jerusalem. And it was probably just before he arrived there that he sent two of his disciples ahead to the little uh, village of Bethphage to get donkeys for his entrance into the city. Now, of course, Jesus could have walked into Jerusalem because, you know, he'd been walking into Jerusalem. Think about it. I mean, he'd been going and on his feet, walking into Jerusalem probably at least three times a year uh, for all the major feasts from the time he was 12 years old, right? All the men were to go to the major feasts. And so uh, it'd been there many times that way, but this time was different. This time he entered the kingdom, uh, not as a visitor uh, or a pilgrim to worship, but this time uh, he was entering as the king. 
and as God's ultimate high priest. And so this time he would ride rather than walk into the city. But Jesus would not enter on some uh, magnificent uh, horse like uh, other earthly conquering kings. You know, and I always think of this when I see Jesus uh, pictured, you know, in his return. Uh, it's a long time ago, kind of a fantasy movie. You see that movie, um, Lady Hawk with Rutger Hauer years, years ago, but the, he rode on this uh, black Frisian stallion. And I, you know, it had, they have the long, all kinds of mane going there and the tufted, uh, what do you call it? The, the long hair on the, the feet and stuff. And they're just spectacular and they're gorgeous. And I, I always think, you know, and I think it's going to be a white one. Jesus is going to come back on one, something like that. It's going to be that, that spectacular. But Jesus, you know, other kings might have come in. Bocasa would have come in that way if he hadn't had <laughs> the horses that he did pull in his, his carriage. Uh, but Jesus did not enter that way. Jesus would enter publicly, but also humbly riding on a donkey in fulfillment of a prophecy from 500 years before with which everybody really was familiar. It's in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, and it reads, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, some critics have pointed out that Luke only mentions the one donkey here, whereas if you go to Matthew, uh, there are two that are mentioned, but Luke doesn't say there weren't two. He just refers to the one upon which Jesus would ride. That's the, that's the issue here. But, and then also, you know, there's some preachers have, have uh, it's, it's interesting. I, a lot of people, uh, friends of mine even have talked about it. I remember hearing it because I've heard this preached before. Preachers will uh, make a big deal out of the donkeys being the animal ridden by Jewish kings. Okay, they say that you know, donkeys were the animal ridden by Jewish kings, at least up to the time of Solomon. Well, how many kings were there till Solomon? <laughs> there's three, right? There's there's Saul, David, and Solomon. And um, what do we have in the scripture about this? Uh, you know, this is again, they're, they're saying that this writing on the... the uh, uh, the donkey is, uh, is supposed to proclaim in itself that Jesus is the king. But, but there were these only these three kings, and we have a mention of Saul out riding, not riding, but searching for his father's donkeys, right? We don't hear him riding the donkeys, but he's out looking for the donkeys. And then uh, David sometimes rode on a female mule, okay? And his son Solomon rode on that very same mule to his coronation. But a mule's not a donkey, Okay, a mule's not a donkey. A mule is the offspring of a male donkey and a female horse, a mare, right? And there are different, you know, there are different species with different numbers of chromosomes. They're, 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 they're different. Mules are 99.9% .9 sterile because they're different. You know, they're a hybrid type creature. They're, they're different things. The prophecy says, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Lo, and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, donkey here is the Hebrew um, male and gender, okay? It's, it's in the Hebrew, it's male and gender, and it's a he ass, is what the word means. It's a he ass. And colt is also a masculine noun, meaning the male foal of a horse or donkey. The word foal is also masculine. And then the second use of the word donkey is feminine for the mother. Uh, a female donkey, not a mare, right? David and Solomon rode on a female mule. Jesus would ride on a male donkey, um, which is the reason I go through this. This is the antithesis of this horse I talked about. A mule, you know, you would see a king ride on a mule. Mules are really uh, hardy and they don't scare easily. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're great riding and uh, work animals for a lot of things. But th this little donkey, this is the antithesis of, of a battle horse. And that, that, that animal uh, that Jesus rode upon which no one had ever set was then accompanied by its mother. Now, there could be 
Fact is, there could not be a clearer fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. Very clear, very specific, right? And, and, and the fact that this animal, the foal, the colt, would allow Jesus to ride it is remarkable, uh, even with the mother along, probably to, to nurse it as, as necessary. It's miraculous that the, that the cult, though, didn't act up. Um, in all of this, though, our, our Lord's entry into Jerusalem that day was a clear declaration that Jesus was the Messiah, the long-awaited king. But why not because of his appearance on uh, an animal attributed to kings, but because he matches the prophecy perfectly. He matches the prophecy absolutely perfectly. Now, some folks might be getting worn out already. Think, <laughs> I'm used to this. I'm afraid I try to do better. But I think some of you are thinking, Pastor Mike's gone off again, all this unnecessary, boring detail. But the thing is, you know, first of all, Jesus rode into Jerusalem at precisely the right time. Right, precisely the right time according to Daniel the prophet. And then fulfilling precisely the prophecy of Zechariah. And also, secondly, he entered Jerusalem as a king. But we got to get this. He, he, he didn't enter as, as the kind of king so many Christians want, to, want him to be. He didn't enter in the way that most of us want to see him. He, Jesus rode into town in a manner that was consistent with his first advent, consistent with his first ministry. Uh, Jesus came the first time in meekness and humility as the suffering servant. This didn't change when he came into Jerusalem that last time. He came not to be served, but to serve. And he entered the holy city in complete humility. He was not yet acting as a conquering king. Uh, he was not acting yet as the roaring lion of Judah. Uh, he came as the lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. And, and he isn't, beloved, he is not the roaring lion today. That's not his ministry today. Uh, yes, he has risen victoriously. And yes, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And ultimately, he is in complete control. But he will not appear as the conquering king until his second advent. Okay? He's not going to appear as the roaring lion until his second advent. Uh, this is the age of grace today. And we are engaged in our Lord's first ministry. That is what has been entrusted to us, right? When Jesus comes the second time, then he will come on a white war horse, perhaps like that one, that Frisian that I, that I described to you as a, he'll come as the conquering king of glory and he will execute judgment on his enemies. Judgment's coming. Now, some of us, and maybe this is why I've been drawn to the, so much detail again today in part, but some of us are in love with the idea of the church militant. And, and I've encountered this since I was a small boy. Um, the church militant is the church engaged in constant warfare against its enemies, the forces of evil, right? Beloved, I don't see that in the scripture. I don't see that except that as we have been called to prayer, we have been called to standing fast in righteousness, and we've been called to spreading the gospel, right? Now, when I see things in the, in the news media, I've been, I was in a bad mood from the time we got a block or so from our house and saw the gas pump this morning. You know, and it's not just the, but it's the, all this stuff that's going on with the current regime, you know, and it's like, I just start boiling over, but it's not incumbent upon me to go out and seize control of the kingdom by force today, right? We're here for prayer, to stand fast in righteousness and spread the gospel. Paul, Paul wrote, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. When I think these things about people who are living so ungodly and, and, and 
forcing immorality and all these other things upon us, I have certain thoughts that are they're righteous in a certain sense, right? Because they are for the moral right. But I'm not bringing every thought of mine into captivity to Christ a whole lot of times. I go off the deep end, right? Jesus says something different, you know, for me, for us. The sword that we've been handed is the word of God. The sword that we've been handed is the word of God. Tens of thousands of Christians want to do battle with the government and with their neighbors and everybody else, and yet they probably can't even find their sword because it's buried under too much dust and too much junk in their house. But they want to make war against the state. And if they were to dig out their sword, they probably wouldn't know how to use it. Our world is in a mess right now. Our country's in a mess. Every sort of evil is pervasive. As you know, I know in my morning prayer, I deviated, you know, more. It's like it's becoming um, to where it's, it's hard for us to, um, to stand for righteousness and have compassion and, and just to navigate this narrow thing because we're to represent Christ, which we have that ministry, right? We're the first ministry, not the second ministry. So my attitude always is to honor the government as I've been told to do, right? To honor those who are in authority over me, to pay my taxes and all these things, and to make sure that the gospel becomes before my, my first prejudices of the flesh. But it's getting when people force their moral opinions on you and stuff, and we see them harming others, especially little kids, it gets harder and harder. We have to come back, though, to the Word of God, not, not what we think or not what we feel. What does God tell us in His Word? Because it doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and His Word does not change. And we don't add to it. We don't take away from it. So... We got this mess around us right now. And the the fact is that, uh, you know, with this pervasive evil, whatever we do, we might be able to slow it down a little bit because Jesus has made us the light of the world and the salt of the earth, right? We've talked about those too many times to go into today. He's made us the light of the world. He's made us the salt of the earth. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given us the great commandments and he's given us the, the, he's commanded us to preach the gospel. But the Roman Empire could not stop our Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem and no one could stop his torture and death on the cross and no one can stop the steady march of our country into complete evil and destruction. It's going to fall eventually. This world's going to burn. This world's going to burn, right? Nobody can prevent our Lord's return in power and glory to judge. No one can stop any of the events that are foretold in Scripture from unfolding exactly as God has set them before us. Now, even though some things we read about in prophecy are not going to take their full form until after the rapture, we already see, I believe, a great falling away from the faith. And and I have to wonder... Uh, Just as God sent confusion among the armies that opposed Israel uh, and he blinded Israel herself, I have to wonder if God hasn't already sent a strong delusion to this nation. You look around, it's like I've talked about this in a positive sense for, for a couple of years now with people because the insanity that I see around me only tells me that this is supernatural. This is not just wicked people. This is people of a reprobate mind. It's, it's insane, the things that people say and do. Um, how else could millions of people become incapable of figuring out their own gender? I'm not being a smart aleck. How else could millions of people become incapable of figuring out whether they're boys or girls or men or women? Uh, 
how could they be capable of murdering their unborn and, and drugging their toddlers to prevent their sexual development and allowing teachers and doctors to work together to, to actually mutilate their bodies when they're still too young to make their own decisions? How could a people with churches on every corner teach their small children perverted sex in the public schools? I mean, I, I, you know, I was somebody forwarded one to me from the Greeley public school system a while back. I looked it up and you can buy it on Amazon too. I thought this is probably another, uh, what is it, you call it a trope or whatever. Uh, this is a, something people have fabricated to inflame things even further. And I know stuff's going on, but it was so bad. It boggles the mind, the things that, that we've seen. There is, there is nothing remotely rational about these things. They are madness. They are insanity and they are evil. And how can the wealthiest nation in the world have so much homelessness and no solution? I'm starting to wonder if God isn't already blinding people and hardening their hearts just as he did with Pharaoh. Because remember, first, Pharaoh hardened his heart Pharaoh hardened his heart. And God said, now God said beforehand what was going to happen, but Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then God said, okay. And what are we looking at in our text today? The hearts of the people of Israel were hardened. So it's not just during, I don't believe the tribulation that this, that this delusion is, is coming upon us. I, I and, and, and you know, I'm not, I don't want to misinterpret the scripture there, but I, I see a, a, an insanity, a blindness to spiritual things. And I talked to my, my good friend, another pastor, uh, this past week. And, you know, for, for 20 some years, you know, us as senior pastors and before that as assistant pastors, we have been uh, handing out food and tracks and uh, uh, having musical events and this and that and the other. And guess what? Nobody ever comes to church. People don't get saved. How many, because a lot of you here have seen, it's like we've had three, four things a year where we cooked out and invited even people who are supposedly seeking God on the end of the building. That's part of their program is seeking God, right? And we've, we've loved them and fed them and patted their heads and rubbed their tummies. And uh, we've gone to different places and people are not responding to the gospel. I don't know. I know that judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. It's, it's just a matter of when, and it's a matter of how many people will, in fact, repent before the end comes. This evil, all this wickedness, makes me angry. And I think it makes most of you angry. We, we've, uh, a lot of times we have a hard time maintaining our cool when we're talking with each other in the fellowship hall, <laughs> Right? It's easy to get wound up. We want to fight this wickedness. And it's like at the same time, we love people and we want to see people saved and we don't want to be harshly judgmental or self-righteous or anything. It's, it's tough. But the Bible tells us, we have to remember, the Bible tells you and me, the weapons of our warfare are different than those of our enemies. And we are still called to love our neighbors and love even our enemies. Jesus said that. I didn't make it up. It's not me trying to take things and coming up to a nice theological conclusion to say, and so you ought to. No, Jesus said we're supposed to love our enemies and we're to do our best to reach them with the gospel. And at some point, I don't know. I, I have to, you know, I, but I, I, I have never discarded the Old Testament. I don't think we're supposed to discard the Old Testament. At some point, it might become necessary for, you know, and even right and just for us to use some other measures to defend ourselves and to protect the innocent. I don't know. But God will make that clear through his word and through our prayers as well as circumstances. There were plenty of evil. We have to remember there, there have always been evil people in the world and evil things going on. And there were in the first century uh, when, when uh, Jesus and the, and the uh, apostles were, were teaching, right? And, and writing things down for us. We cannot act in anger or pride uh, or hatred. We can't do that. And 
We can't do that and call ourselves faithful to Jesus. There are people who are doing that already, right? Responding in that way, but they're not representing Christ. Our Lord's example for us is meekness and humility and love. And that was the case even in his triumphal entry, knowing full well everything that's going on around him. Well, Jesus sent his disciples to get the donkey and they, came, they immediately encountered just exactly the resistance that he would in, had indicated they'd run into and, and the owners let them have the animal also just as exactly as he'd said. Now, for some reason, a lot of people scratch their heads about this wondering, you know, and I, I, I confess I did too. It's like, well, had Jesus already sent somebody else ahead before? <laughs> you know, how did this how did this work out? You know, it's like it's how did these people know who the master is and that the master has need of him? And it's like we don't have to worry about any of that. It, it, this was this was divinely ordained, right? So so it wasn't necessary for anybody else to go in advance of these guys. They went and it worked out the, the way the Lord said it would. This was simply a sovereign work of God. Everything was in place. Just exactly as Jesus said. And, and it all came together just exactly as Jesus said. And then they spread their own clothes on the donkey uh, like a saddle. And other people cast their, their, their clothes, um, their own garments on the road before him as an act of submission. Uh, see, placing their clothes under the, beneath his feet, they were symbolically placing themselves beneath his feet uh, as their king. Look at verse 36. And as he went... Many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Then, as he began his descent into the Kidron Valley, uh, that would take him into the city. Then the mass of disciples, not just the 12, but all this mass of people from within and without the city began rejoicing and praising God for, for all these miraculous uh, works that, they'd, that Jesus had been doing that we've been studying about. And, and, and as the people in the Lord's entourage and the people from the city came together, they were, uh, they were continually laying all their clothes on the road, like we said. And some cut down, as we see in other places, some cut down palm branches and laid them in his path. <clears throat> now, palm branches symbolized victory and joy and celebration, right? No doubt about that. And so this is part of the joy of celebration, but they were also a symbol of nationalism. Okay, the palm branches were also a symbol of nationalism. They, they were a sign of the people's desire and their hope for deliverance from Roman rule. The palm was a symbol on the coin during the second Maccabean revolt. Okay, and, and when they shouted Hosanna, they're saying, oh, save us now. And then they're waving the palm fronds. So this is, this is a call for their king to take power and to reign over them and to deliver them. A comparison of the gospel accounts tells us that these peop the people were uh, really shouting a number of different things in praise and, and in expectation. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, that's a, that's a quote, though, from the Hallel Psalms, uh, Psalms 113 through 118, that are recited at the beginning of the Passover supper and also at the Feast of Tabernacles. And that acknowledges that Jesus is God's Messiah. When they, when they did that, they were acknowledging that Jesus was the Messiah, their king. And, and then they said also, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. A little bit different than what, they, what the shepherds uh, were told by the angels, right? So then there was peace on earth and goodwill to men. This is peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And they thought that, that this was something that, that could only take place once Messiah was enthroned, right? It, it, this was only common sense to them. They... They couldn't see that there could be any peace in the heart of God while there was no peace in Jerusalem, his city, right? Now, look now at uh, verses 39 through 40. <clears throat> and some of the disciples called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Uh, no surprise to us, I think that the, the Pharisees were more than miffed at this. They were, they were outraged at this. They, were, uh, they had 
already begun to conspire among themselves a long time before, probably now working with their enemies, the Sadducees, to kill Jesus at the right opportunity because of what they considered his blasphemy. But they were, they were surely worried too that the Romans were going to have a problem with all of this, with this big parade and everything, and the, the fact that people thought of Jesus as king of the Jews. Rome, we see it clearly in the, in the Acts of the Apostles, right? Um, Rome didn't put up with disturbances to the peace. Right? Rome, didn't, Rome didn't put up with that, let alone a challenge to Caesar. Uh, the Pharisees called on Jesus to, to shut the people up because they couldn't do it themselves. Uh, there was the, the, things were out of control, right? And, and so they were afraid of what else would, would happen and that, because they would all get the blame for us, just as the high priest had said. But as we've said before, today, nothing could stop, nothing could even slow down the unfolding of God's plan as Jesus came into town here. This was all to foretold 500 years before. It was always part of the plan. And, and Jesus told the, uh, the Pharisees, if these people should stop praising me, then all my other created things would just take over they would praise me instead, and then and, and they will praise me. Uh, verse 41, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Those are somber words. At this point, Jesus was overwhelmed with emotion. Uh, uh, we could call it a deep emotional concern. It's just, it's, it's, it's a profound grief is what it is. Really, his heart is broken here. Um, and I think while it's hard for us to grasp that there's all these things going on and Jesus is riding into town and he is coming in as the king, although a humble king, but he's not like softly weeping with a little tear here and there or whatever. He's not, not his eye isn't glistening. The, the, the word means he is sobbing. Jesus is on, riding on the animal and he is just broken down in tears. Nobody knew as well as Jesus about the, the history of God's prophets, though, preaching, teaching, pleading with the people of Jerusalem. How many times for how many centuries? And all of God's tremendous blessing all of God's long suffering for all those years and all of Israel's apostasy, all of Israel's outright rebellion. Um, now Jesus knew that, you know, it wasn't just the hundreds of thousands of people who were not at the parade. It wasn't just those people. It wasn't all the citizens. It wasn't all the, the thousands of visitors. Uh, it wasn't just those people, but it was almost all the people who would be rejecting him. The ones in the parade would be rejecting him. Uh, the ones that were praising God right now, right at that point, they were going to face God's judgment. Most of these people were going to perish. God is going to judge them. These very people who were praising him and who were so joyful would be screaming for his blood in just a few days. He was, not, he was not unaware of that. He knew what was going on and, and, and he knew that they would face God's judgment. And even though they, they, they would cry for his blood, he wanted them to be saved. And this was the city where God had chosen to manifest his presence and to meet with his people. Uh, it was the place that he had actually authorized his, his temple to be built. Um, and the people... <clears throat> They'd continue to be unfaithful, no matter what he did. They'd always been easily seduced away from God. Makes me think of the church today. How, you know, how many denominations are we in the first place instead of God's church, instead of Jesus' church, you know, and then we go off and it's like 
we try to get along and work with other churches because, well, we agree on the essentials. But then when we get together, it's real hard to worship even based on those essentials, isn't it? There's so many things. And then the wackadoodle things that, and the wickedness that come into the, the church. It's easy to look at Israel, right, and see, see where they've gone wrong. I'm sure Jesus is grieving over much of the church today. <clears throat> like we saw in the parable of the miners last week, though, the Jews, this is reason, Jesus' reason for weeping. The Jews had, um, like in that parable, the Jews had declared of Jesus, we will not have this man reign over us. That's what they'd done. And so destruction would come, and it would be horrific uh, because of their continual, willful, hard-hearted, self-righteous unbelief. God's judgment was set to come upon them. The, the things that made for peace were always available. God pleaded with them to accept these things. Uh, Jesus talked about them throughout his whole ministry. Repentance and faith in Christ. Wasn't so hard. They'd always been available, repentance and faith in Christ, but they, they willfully rejected those things. And so, so very much like Pharaoh, God turned their willful choice of blindness into judicial blindness. You know, and you've had this probably with a family member, if maybe, I hope you've shared with friends and co-workers over the years, because most of us have walked with the Lord for some time now, but Israel was like, People try to share the gospel and they're la, 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 right? And that's the way our friends and family are. That's the way the people are on the street today. Street preachers, the, they don't hear a word they're actually saying. They just hate, you know, they just hate them. And they reject them and, and it's going to be dealt with. So Jesus says, but now those things are hidden from your eyes. Repentance and faith those things that make for peace, now those things are hidden from your eyes. See, God hid them. They did, like I said, you know, I, I'm not seeing that stuff. I, I don't understand. Can you bring me some more evidence? I know Robin and I have talked over the years about her witnessing with people. And it's like, they want this, and then they want that, and then they want this. And it's like, I don't know how many people I've talked to, that even some family members. And it's like, they always want more information. You know, and they, oh, I'm, they're so interested. But after 20 years, they still haven't, haven't given their lives to the Lord because they're really plugging up their ears. And so what happens, God hardened their hearts and God blinded them. These things are hidden from their eyes because God did it. Most individuals were past the point of rescue and the nation was past the point of rescue because of the things that are unfolding here 70 years from now, it's the bitter end. There's some hyperbole here, but Titus is going to come in 70 AD, just about 40 years later, and he will utterly destroy the temple and the city. Almost everything was knocked down as flat as a football field and, and burned, and thousands and thousands and thousands were slaughtered. And he did leave a couple of towers standing so that people could go up in the towers and survey the destruction. He wanted people to see the work that they had accomplished and and overthrowing the city. And all this would happen because Israel willfully chose to close their hearts and minds to the Savior God promised them and sent to live among them. God had come down in human flesh um, and dwelt among them. He had, he had lived a sinless life among them. He'd gone about doing good always and performing miracles of mercy and opening the word to their understanding. And, and they had rejected him. They refused to repent. They refused to believe. They refused to receive Jesus as their Lord. And see, that's God's one and only perfect provision. God's made provision for everybody, but it's, but it's right there. If you, if, you don't, if you don't accept that provision that he's made, then there isn't any other way. 
Queen Elizabeth II just celebrated her platinum jubilee, 70 years on the throne. God bless her. But, you know, she didn't look all that good. And uh, um, she got pretty tired. And there are, because of that, a couple of guys waiting in the wings, right, for what is surely going to happen before too long. Actually, what happened to his imperial majesty, Bokasa I, is all too typical of what happens with kings, with earthly kings. So, you know, we try to plan, we try to prepare, we try to hold on to what we have, but really, we don't have all that much time after the coronation, do we? It goes quickly. But Jesus, Jesus is a different kind of king. And he gives us life and he gives us power and direction and confidence to live. I've always admired those horses that accompany the queen and her family. I kind of like that pageantry. I don't know about you guys, but I like that magnificence. Our King Jesus came riding on a humble little donkey. And so Paul writes in Philippians 2, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Let's pray together and then we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper.